Well, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, we've only been here one evening and a little bit of this morning, and I'm already blessed beyond measure. And uh, I've been really excited for this weekend because, like Catherine was praying, because we weren't able to get together last year, and it's very important for us to be together and uh, to minister to one another because we've all gone through things. We all have hardships, and, um, and it's been a hard year, more ways than one. And um, when uh, Teresa asked me if I would be willing to share a little bit of my testimony, I told her I needed to pray about it because... Um, not necessarily that I need to pray, but I needed to pray because this is out of my comfort zone. <laughs> and, um, but I know God, and I told her I, th- I needed to pray about it. And um, I wanted to make sure what God wanted me to share. And um, so I let her know that, yes, the Lord shared with me um, what to share. And, um, and it happened to be out of the book of Ruth. And... Uh, the Lord had shown me even back in Zambia. I had, I've studied Book of Ruth before and done a devotion on it. And then when we was in Zambia, he had laid on my heart the Book of Ruth. And I hadn't gotten to finish it before we had, um, you know, come back for a furlough. And uh, my plan was is that when I went back, then I would have a, the, with the ladies, I would be able to share with the ladies. And... Um, so I was going through that, and the Lord showed me that this, Tammy, is what I want you to share. And um, so we know, I'm just going to kind of highlight different things, but we know that Naomi went with her husband when he went to Moab. She was obedient to follow. She was submissive. And uh, whenever Brian t- told me that God had laid on his heart that we were going to go to Africa, I've shared this before, but not everybody here was at the conference um, in October. But when Brian shared with me that we were going to go to Africa, you know, I always wanted to go to Africa like on a short two-week term, you know, not a long, not a long term. And, um, but because I knew I needed to be submissive and I wanted to be obedient to the Lord. And um, I gave up my job and I gave up everything here. I mean, we left our children and... Uh, so we went. Well, Naomi, when you see in Naomi's life too, I mean, Amalek went down to Moab. It doesn't say that she was submissive, but she went. So she was submissive to him, regardless if they were going in the right direction or not. And um, so we need to be submissive. You know, you don't hear that a lot in today's culture because we don't like to be submissive to someone. And uh, we need to be under that protection of covering, not only to our Lord, but under our husbands. And uh, so she went. And, of course, we know that Amalek died and her two sons. And um, Naomi was in Moab living her life, just like I was in Zambia and living my life. I poured out my life in Zambia by ministering to the ladies I did different things, invested in the ladies in the ministry. I helped with the Mishuli Clinic and tried to provide. I started the Moms for Buckets for them to be able to minister to the new moms. And um, with GCMS, the organization there, I was the treasurer. And not only that, I was doing family and home. And um, so I poured out my life there. And um, Naomi poured out her life we're in Moab where she was for 10 years. And um, then it come to a time where, you know, she wanted to go back. You know, she heard that there was food in, in um, her homeland. And so she wanted to go back. And uh, Naomi says that in, you know, in verse chapter 1 and verse 21, she says, I went out full and the Lord had brought me home again empty. She wasn't empty because of the Lord. She was empty because of herself. Because when you're doing, you know, if you're, she went out full, just like I went out full with the spirit of the Lord, full of the word of God, encouraged from the church body to go. And so we went and I was full of the spirit. 
But sometimes when you go and you, you, you know how it is with a ministry and stuff, you spend your time, you know, your, your hard time that you're invested. It's not just about the time, but your heart, because you put your heart into everything that you're doing. You get spent. And um, she was, you know, she went out full and she came back empty. But that was her own fault because, you know, she, I don't know where she was more spiritually, but um, for me, I mean, I was still in the word of God and I had my husband and be able to pray and stuff. But when we came back, um, with all the work in Zambia, that's what deplete, you know, depletes you. So when you have ministry and you're involved in ministry and your work here, if you don't stay and replete, replete you, then you're going to be empty. So we need to replenish. That's what's going on here. We're being replenished. We're being filled up to be able to continue on. And uh, Naomi started investing in Ruth. We see that later on in the chapters. And, uh, but it was Ruth, like um, she was sharing, Heather was sharing last night when Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. God used Ruth in Naomi's life at that time. And then Naomi starts in chapter two, you know, she starts encouraging um, Ruth. So she was ministering to her. We need one another to be able to minister to one another, to encourage one another, to continue going the fight. We still have time. We don't have a lot of time, but we still need to be ministering to one another and reaching the lost. And Naomi says she wasn't, um, sorry, I'm getting off track here. So she went out spiritually with all the work. We went out spiritually full and then came back. But if you allow those things to um, take over, then your, your heart's going to be hardened. You're going to be um, what we were just singing about. You know, we're, you're going to be depleted, and you're not going to be trusting in the Lord. You're going to be like Naomi was saying, that she came back empty. We're going to be empty if we don't do that. And Naomi started investing in Ruth. You can see that throughout and she, um, they did one, and they invested in one another. And uh, just like I need to be ministering here today. So when I came back, I had my stroke um, that um, we came back in September. And then that December, I had my stroke. And, um, you know, if I allowed that, if I allowed those things, then I could become bitter because... My desire, I wanted to go back to Africa. And when Brian come to me and he says that we're not supposed to go back, it's like, why, Lord? Because I wasn't finished doing the things that you had laid on my heart to do. And, um, you know, you can be angry and sin not, right? And, um, but one of the things that I wanted to make sure because... Naomi came back bitter, and I didn't want to be bitter. And in the Bible, it talks about, um, in uh, Ephesians 4, verse 31, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And I just brought that up to share, because the Lord wanted me to share that, because it goes backwards, actually. So it starts with... This is how I was taught, that it starts with malice. And then we live, we have the intent on a person or someone that's wronged us. That brings about malice in our heart. And then when we have that malice, then you build on that. If we don't put it away, then it's evil speaking. And then clamor. And then we become angry. And then we become wrathful. And then we become bitter. And um, I didn't want to become bitter because I needed to pray that the Lord show me through this because, like I said, I wasn't ready to stay here. I wanted to go back. And uh, believe me, it's been very hard, you know, to, to um, 
you know, when I talk to Crystal and stuff, to be able to, you know, encourage her and the things that they're going, you know, when they talk about everything that's going on there, because we still are part of that, it was very, very hard. And uh, because you can't just cut it off. You can't just say, I'm done with that and just walk away. And um, because I needed to be encouraging to Crystal, because Crystal is going through some of the same stuff that I went through. So, you know, we need to, as a church, continue to pray for them because the spiritual battle is real. And it's even more so, it appears more so even when we're over there, more is the same. Spiritual battles here opposed to there, but more so it's more intense there. So Naomi started investing. And so that shows me that I needed to start investing in others here because I have to accept the fact that we're not going back permanently and that now I need to be here and involved here and uh, within my church body with the ladies and ministering and reaching out to the lost, my neighbors. I need to continue on investing. And because, um, you know, I'm blessed because, you know, I can still have another stroke. I know that. And, uh, but I need to use my time wisely while I'm here and to invest. And um, I just need to be investing in the body. And that's what Naomi started to do, too. And Ruth was good for Naomi and helped get her back to where she needed to be. And um, you ladies here, I've talked to several different ladies one-on-one, different things. And you guys have been encouraging to me and um, through this time because I haven't, um, I stayed home with Titus uh, while he was going to school because I had to take him back and forth to school and pick him up while Brian was in Africa. So God has really showed me a lot of things about myself personally, and this was one of them. And then... um, He reminded me that this is what I needed to share. And uh, God wants us to refill it. He wants to refill us after we've emptied ourselves and continue continue investing in others. And uh, so just like Naomi in the end, you know, with Ruth. And um, so I know I I need to go, but I just wanted to just share that. It's just a little bit... But we need to not have bitterness. We need to continue to encourage one another, edify one another, and not allow the circumstances in our lives to cause us to become bitter. We need to give those things to the Lord. And one of the things, one more thing I'll say is, um, sorry, is here in Ruth. And um, she says at the end, And the women said unto her, Naomi, in chapter 14, or chapter 4, verse 14, it says, And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. Jesus is our restorer of our life, and a nourisher of thine old age. Let's face it, I'm getting older. (laughs) I can't do the things I used to do. And um, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons have borne him. So Naomi had issues in her life, but God drew her back under her, or under him. And uh, these ladies reminded her that we have a restorer of thy life. And Jesus is our restorer. So no matter what, you know, God's going to use me no matter what. There's, um, he is doing some things right now, and I'll share at another later time. Um, and I'm excited about it. And uh, I'll, I'll share in the future about the other ministry and the things that I'll be helping and doing. And um, Heather, thank you for being here and um, your encouragement. <laughs> not going to fight it. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'm kind of jumping right off where Tammy started, 
which is so cool. I didn't want to know what Tammy's testimony was on purpose because I just wanted to watch God work. And when you see a time like this come together, and I didn't know what songs were going to be sung. I didn't know what Catherine's testimony was going to be. I didn't know what Tammy's testimony was going to be. Um, but God knew what he wanted spoke, what he wanted shared. And um, if you can just get out of the way enough, then that gets to take place. And it's beautiful. And I love it. And so thank you. And um, I'm in that place that Tammy was talking about and kind of didn't even realize it because um, I tend to set high expectations for myself. I know nobody else in this room does that, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking, you've only been on the mission field 10 months. You ain't done nothing yet. So just go back and do your women's conference. And we got back here last week, and it was a little bit um, uncomfortable. I don't know how else to describe it yet. I haven't processed all of it. <laughs> it's awkward. And I was tired, and I hadn't done anything yet. And uh, I just knew that I had done battle for 10 months and not even realized it. Like you talk about it, like, oh, we're in a spiritual battle. Yes, we all are every day. If you are a follower, follower of Jesus, you are in spiritual battle every day. Um, but I jumped into this other battle, this other location with my husband, and it's different. I can't explain how it's different. I can't explain that yet. Um, and maybe you can't get it till you've done it. I don't know. But I didn't realize it till I got back. And I was like, I am so tired. Why am I so exhausted? And I'd been in the Word. And I'd been praying. But thank you. <laughs> that may come in handy. Um, but uh, it just kind of surprised me a little. Um, how worn out I was, how depleted I was. So thank you for that. Um, and then, like I said, when I went through my notes with Lee and I had these things written down that I was going to talk to him about and some things that God was working in my heart about, and I was like, I really need to talk to Lee about this. And, but I'm going to wait till after the women's conference because that's priority and I want to do that first. And I'll just talk to him about this stuff later. And I got my little notes in my phone because I'm the type, if I write stuff down, then I'll remember what, was, what I wanted to talk about. And if not, it'll be gone 10 seconds later. So... Um, then as I was going through my notes with him at lunch yesterday, God's addressing everything on my little notepad that I needed to go over with my husband. And like, um, this isn't really something you need to talk to your husband about. This is something you needed to talk to me about. And I thought I had. But it just wasn't that intimate, open time. I prayed, read my Bible, check the box. It was different yesterday. And so I think if you'll just keep battling, keep at it. Maybe you feel like you're in a rut. Like Catherine was saying, there's like this three month issue and she's just working through it and working through it and working through it. Well, what was different about last night than the last three months? I don't know. Neither does Catherine. But God just knows that she kept at it and she kept at it and she kept at it. And last night was his intimate time with her. Something was special. And so um, you'll hear me use that word a lot. And maybe sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I think it feels a little overused lately. It's like a popular word to use. But it's such an accurate word because it's exposed. Like you feel exposed. And that is an uncomfortable place to be sometimes. No, not sometimes, all the time. That is an uncomfortable. Uh, I, maybe there are, there are a, an occasional person who can just stand in front of the mirror, you know, in all their glory, exposed and be confident and that, mm -mm. 
<laughs> nope. Thank you. I have one. Thank you so much. You know what? I will take another. I may need it. It's, it hasn't been drank out. Thank, well, it's good, sister. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. So um, that exposed place is where God does so much work and where we're available, undistracted, um, to receive. And it can be so uncomfortable, but with him, I was sharing with the ladies this morning, with him, all I have to compare relationships to is what I know, right? And all I know in relationships is relationships with people outside of my relationship with my Savior, okay? So all you have to compare to is your relationships with your parents or your family or your friends, whomever, humans, the human people. That's all you have to compare to. And it can get so easy to humanize God and be like, oh, it's just, I don't want to be exposed because it's just going to be like that relationship or that one time or I'll feel critiqued or I'll feel inadequate. And he's the only person, the only relationship where you will not feel that way. Uh, I'm, I'll feel inadequate, but it's different. It's to my, in the Bible we say edification. It's to my building up. Because it's not, it, it's not, it's a relationship of love and of grace and for your good. And that's what I was talking to the ladies about this morning is just how amazing it is that I get the opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ in perfection, in no condemnation, no critique, no guarding. If there's guardrails, it's because I put them between me and God, not him. And he's just waiting for me to open that back up, open that back up, expose that. And that has been my heart's desire for this whole weekend, is that you would come in here and feel safe enough to be spiritually exposed before the Lord with each other, I don't need to know all your dirty laundry and you don't need to know mine. But you can know there's dirty laundry without knowing what it is, okay? I promise you there's some. I've shared a little. Like, we all have that. So whatever is keeping you from that today, like whatever guardrail defense mechanism you have in place right now, I'm just going to pray and ask God to move that out of the way um, so we can just have a little bit more time in his word so he can just work in our hearts and our lives um, that he can just reassure you of his love for you and that he's a good father. He gives good gifts. He is faithful. He is perfect. He is flawless. He will not let you down. He will not make you feel inadequate or critiqued. You can stand there exposed and he will just mold you into perfection for his sake, right? Through his son Jesus, spiritually you are perfect. And that's how he sees you. And those flaws and all of that is attached to our flesh. And when you're his child, when you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that's resolved. That's paid for. You're spiritually perfect. Until you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you may feel that critique a little. 
That's the law. That's what the Bible says is our schoolmaster to bring us into a relationship with him. Not to say, oh my goodness, you're terrible. But to say, spiritually you're a little inadequate here, but my son has paid for that. And in a relationship with him, you are spiritually perfect and you can walk that way. Um, And so if there's a point not a point in your life where you've trusted the Lord as your Savior, where you've had that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where you've just taken that step of faith. No, you don't have it all together. You've not cleaned yourself up. None of that is required. All I'm saying is if you've not started that relationship, just that step of faith, I'm going to start a relationship with, with God today through his son Jesus. Please come talk to me. If all you do is walk up to me and go, I'm that person, I'll know what you mean. But there's no more important first step in your life than to start a relationship with God through his son. Um, But that takes that openness, that exposure, that letting down those guardrails. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive back into Ruth a little bit today. God, thank you so much for this time, for these ladies, for this opportunity to minister through your word. Father God, just lay myself at your feet, Lord. Use me to share your word clearly. God, I pray that whatever distractions may be running through our mind, ah, Whatever prejudice we have come in here with, whatever guard guardrails we have up, Lord, blocking us from just exposing ourselves to you and you alone, Lord, help us to get that out of the way. Soften our hearts, Lord. Just uh, break through those, those walls that we've built up to protect ourselves, knowing that spiritually we can just be at your feet and be right where you want us to be. God, we love you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for these ladies, for the sacrifices that they made to be here for taking the time to just step in here and hear your word, Lord. Um, I pray that if there's one person that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, just help me to be available to them. Help them to see me open and available. And the other ladies here, Miss Cheryl, Linda, Teresa, available to share your word with them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, okay, I got my clicker. We're going to be in Ruth chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 1 through 9. We're going to focus on 8 and 9. And just, I like a plan. It's to my fault sometimes, but I like a plan. Okay, so there's like five points, three scriptures with each point. Get your pencil ready, okay? That's the plan. <laughs> oh, you, and you can be flipping. I love to hear the flipping and the turning, um, but we got, we got scripture today again, so that's good. Um, so Ruth chapter 2. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. I love that, her hat. That's like, a, she just accidentally went to that part of the field where that Boaz was. I like that. She was scheming. Okay, and, Bo, and behold, Boaz, verse 4, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. 
Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. What were they emphasizing in this verse? Oh, that girl, she from over there. <laughs> Twice, right? The Moabitish from Moab. Well, duh, you just called her a Moabitish. I get where she's from. Um, but they, I, I get the feeling they were warning him. And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, hearest thou not my daughter? God has said that to me a few times. Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of that which, is the, which the young men have drawn. Let's read verse 8 and 9 again, real quick together. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So in verse 8 and 9, there's five truths. Oh, that's our scripture. I missed that part. Lamentations 3.58. Don't forget that. O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. But verse 8 and 9. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Five truths for today's believer. Um, we're talking to women. And Boaz said, my daughter. Um, but spiritually, it could be for any Christian. Um, but we're kind of looking at it through eyes of women, because that's what we are. Um, Boaz tells Ruth five things um, that were important in verse 8 and 9. Let me get to my right spot. First thing, don't go elsewhere to glean. There's no better place to be than following Jesus, than walking in his way. There's no better place to be. And when you would glean something, you would go behind the people that were harvesting and you would get the leftovers. So in a way, it feels a little bit secondary. Um... But it, it wasn't. It was how she was being cared for. Um, and so maybe you're not like the pastor's wife or a deacon's wife or whatever title. That's not secondary. If you're a child of God and you're part of this family, don't go elsewhere to glean. This is your family. This is the, the body God gave you and wants you to be a part of. And it's not secondary, it's crucial. Ruth had a very important role. She didn't know what that was yet. But Boaz said, don't go elsewhere to glean. Be right here, right here. And there's lots of scripture that shares with us that there's no better way to be than in the way of the Lord. Psalm 46.10. See how God is so good. We've read that already. We're going to read it again. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. I am terrible at being still. I am a doer. I am a nurse. I am a fixer. I like to fix things. 
I like a plan. I like order. Concrete, sequential. Um, and to be still is to wait on God sometimes and just see what his plan is. And going to a country where I don't speak the language fluently and know the culture and the customs and the ways will put me still real quick. And it's uncomfortable. But there's a promise in Psalm 46.10. There's a couple of them. Be still and know that I am God. When I'm in that still time, it reminds me he is God. And he will be exalted among the heathen. He will be exalted in the earth. So I don't always understand it. But somewhere in that stillness is a promise that God will be exalted. And I just have to trust that and stay in the way. Don't go elsewhere to glean. Stay here, right here. Deuteronomy 5, 32, and 33. Deuteronomy is back at the front of your Bible in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I still sing the um, Awana song. I just want you to know that. That's how I remember them. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 32. And 33. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you that ye may live and that it may be well with you and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Got to stay right here. Right here. And yeah, that's Old Testament, and it was good for them, and it's good for us. It's a good picture. Stay right here. Matthew 7, 14. So it wasn't just the Old Testament. We get the same commandment in the New Testament. Matthew 7, 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. But that, that path, it's right here. Don't go elsewhere to glean. Just come right here, right down this row, behind these ladies, right here. They have the blueprint, right? Come right behind them and glean. Um, Elizabeth Elliot said this about Amy Carmichael. She, Amy Carmichael was a missionary in India, a single female missionary in India. She, she's brave. Her great longing was to have a single eye for the glory of God. Whatever might blur the vision God had given her of his work, whatever could distract or deceive or tempt other to seek anything but the Lord Jesus himself, she tried to elim eliminate. It's a great goal. It's a goal, okay? It's a goal we should have. It's something I would aspire to be like. Um, wow. It's a plan. It's a process. It, doing those things will keep you in that, in that row gleaning. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the right, to the left. Can't do it. Okay, right here. Blinders on the horse, right? Um, so that single eye, that was the, those were the words that caught me in that quote, was to have a single eye for the glory of God, right here. Those were our scriptures if you didn't get them written down. Psalm 46, 10, Deuteronomy 5, 32, 33, and Matthew 7, 14. The second thing that... Boaz told her in Ruth chapter 2, verse 8, he said, Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. 
Okay, so we're going to talk more about abiding in detail this afternoon. That's going to be our jumping off point this afternoon. We're going to touch on it right here. We're going to dive into it this afternoon. Um, because God did a whole lot of work when we moved to Alabama in my heart about abiding. And I will share my testimony about that. Um, but he said, don't go glean elsewhere, abide here. Um, and so Psalm 91.1. Turn there with me. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this this afternoon, but God was very specific with me in the fact that there's two different words there, dwell and abide. Those are different words. Yeah, they sound really similar, but he chose different words on purpose to convey a message to us. And we need to approach his word that way. Every word, we need to hang on it. Why this word, God? Why didn't you use this word? Oh, because you wanted to say this. He's that specific for us. And so we need to study the word, not just read through it, but get in it and know what he's saying to you personally. Um, but Psalm 91.1 says, he, uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And then John chapter 15. That'll be a little piece of homework. Read the whole thing. Okay? The whole thing. It's abiding. Abide, abide, abide. You're going to see that word a lot in John chapter 15. And as you read through there, you're going to see a scripture that says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's a very definite statement. And it goes back to that jumping off point that I talked about earlier. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're lost, if there's not a time in your life when you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're apart from him. And you can do nothing. And so the first thing to do is just step into that relationship with him. Then you can accomplish something. If you are saved... Apart from him, you can still do nothing. You're saved. But if you're not in his word, if you're not praying, if you're not spending time with him, you're not going to be able to accomplish those things that you want to accomplish in your life. You're like, well, I want to be a kinder person. Um, I want to be better with my children. I want to be nicer to my husband. I want to have friends. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Like, I mean, I can be a pretty good person. I can be a pretty good wife. Average mom, isn't that good enough? Isn't that good enough? Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so abiding in him is how we rectify that apart from me. Okay? Abide in him. We'll go into that more this afternoon. Um, a definition of abide, to rest. Right, we talked about dwelling. Dwelling is just like living there, relationship. I got a place to dwell. It's my house. Abiding. It's more intimate. It's a place of rest. All right, the third thing that we learn about our relationship with God through this picture of Boaz and Ruth is to learn and to grow. Um, he said, see the elders and go after them, right? Um, verse 2, Ruth knew the way of Naomi's people. She said back in Ruth chapter 2, let me get there. Verse 2. 
In Ruth chapter 2, verse 2, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. She knew the ways of Naomi's people and like how things, the culture and the customs. Um, but in verse 8 and 9, Boaz gives her specific instructions. Um, verse 9, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. That is discipleship. You'll hear that word um, in this church right away. Okay, that is you and someone else who's been a Christian a long, little longer time than you have coming along beside you and showing you how to glean in the field, Right? Um, let, it says, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Uh, so that was Boaz's instructions for Ruth. Find that lady who seems to know a little more than you do. <laughs> and we all have somebody who knows a little more than we do. Even if you're discipling someone, you may still have a mentor or someone who is in that relationship with you still. I do. And I have ladies that I'm discipling. So it's, it's a never-ending process. But Boaz said, find that person. Go after them. So ladies, if you're not in a discipleship relationship, if you're not learning from someone um, how to follow the Lord, get in it. Find it. Get with Catherine. Get paired up. Find that person. Um, and... That is one of the, the ways that Boaz was telling Ruth to follow him in this example. But for us, it's how to follow the Lord. Get in that relationship. Um, we see lots of examples where we're told to get in these types of relationships. Titus 2, chap, uh, Titus 2 verse 4. Flip there for me. Titus 2, verse 4. So at the beginning of Titus chapter 2, it's telling um, the aged men, uh, it says, I'm just going to start at the beginning, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Why? Verse 4. That they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. I had to be taught to love my husband and to love my children. The feelings that I had when I got married were fantastic. According to the word of God, I did not know how to love my husband. I had to be taught. And so it takes that discipleship relationship to learn to love your husband and to love your children and how you do that. Um, Matthew 28, 20. teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This comes right after the Great Commission. Go ye therefore. Why? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. So again, we're, we are commanded to teach others, okay, and to be taught. Not just be teaching, but also to be taught. Luke chapter 10. Verse 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. What was the good part? She was at the feet of Jesus. Martha had gotten in a tizzy because she was working her tail off, and her sister wasn't helping. And I have been there. 
<laughs> and God said, let her be. She hath chosen that good part. One thing was needful for Mary at that time. One thing. To be at his feet and hearing what he had to say. That was it. Um, next thing. Oh, a quote. A.W. Tozer, a true disciple, does not consider Christianity a part-time commitment. He has become a Christian in all parts of his life. He has reached the point where there is no turning back. We need to, we need to be there. Sometimes I need to remind myself to be there. Sometimes I've been there and then, ooh, get distracted. <gasps> Don't go elsewhere to glean. <laughs> Right here. The fourth thing that Boaz wanted to say is that God will protect us. Ruth chapter 2, verse 9. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? God protects us. In Exodus 14, 14, the Lord tells Moses to speak to the children of Israel that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened and that he would fight for them. He protects us. He fights for us. In Isaiah 31, 5, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. This is specifically talking about Jerusalem, but we can see, we can see the picture here for a child of God, for a follower of Jesus. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. Psalm 140. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God, hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O oh God the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. I mean, these words, I don't know what they do for you, but for me, I'm like, bring it. I can do this. But I don't always feel like that. Okay? But it's his word, it's just reading the word. Time in his word. These are promises. Boaz is like five truths about walking with God. Right here. Here it is. The fifth thing. God provides for us. Back to Ruth chapter 2. Verse 9. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go without after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Like, I already know you're going to have this need. Here you go. He provides for us. Um, the law of first mention. Remember we talked about that yesterday, just finding something, the first place it's mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 22 Verse 8, chapter 22, verse 8, very first book of the Bible, Genesis 22, 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. He's a God of provision. Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
These scriptures being repeated this weekend is not an accident. When God repeats himself, Pastor Joe says that's his volume control. Like God has no volume, right? He just speaks. But when he repeats himself, that's his volume control. And you've heard from different people, same scripture repeated more than once this weekend, that's his volume control. He's like, remember I said this? Remember? But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Romans 8.32. The most important thing that God ever provided for us was his son an opportunity to have a relationship with him, to be reconciled to him through the sacrifice of his son. Our sin demanded a price be paid. In the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice animals, the blood of animals, to pay the price for their sin. But now God offered his son as a sacrifice for that sin. And by receiving that sacrifice, by receiving that gift, you can enter into that relationship with him. And I, I feel like that's the most important thing that God has ever provided any of us. Amen. Romans 8.32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He so longs to be your provider. And when you have that relationship with God through Jesus Christ and that provision for sin, then he can provide other things. And he longs for that. Um, Psalm 81.10. One more. I lied. Not one more. <laughs> A couple more. Psalm 81.10. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. Bless him. He knows me. Because my mouth is open wide more often than not. And he loves me anyway. And he's like, I'm the Lord thy God. I brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you. I saved your soul. I know your mouth is open wide. I got this. Ruth chapter 2. Surprise, back to Ruth chapter 2. But go down to verse 15 and 16. Because... Ruth got her instructions from Boaz. But it wasn't just provision. It was provision in abundance. Like more than you need, more than you thought to ask for. Verse 15, and when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. She got to go get barley from the places that she wasn't even supposed to go. And he told them and drop it on purpose for her that she'll have extra. Give her more than she ever asked for. Give her more than she needs. Just give her abundance. And that's how God is. Not everything's roses. Not everything's easy. But the abundance of his character, the abundance of his faithfulness, the abundance of his grace and his love, and it doesn't end. There is no limit to the amount of his character that he wants to share with you. So some closing thoughts. Boaz shared his vision for Ruth. 
before he redeemed her. Okay, so this, if you're a Bible scholar, you're going to like cringe right now. Hold on. But just hang with me for just a second. Lee and I talked all the way through this together. <laughs> so in the Old Testament, culturally, customarily, there was a process to redeeming a woman who had lost her husband. And that was what Boaz was doing. And through that, we see a picture of salvation, okay? No, he was not saving her. That's not what I'm saying. But through this process of legally redeeming her, we see how God wants to have a relationship with us through his son, Jesus Christ. And he shared that vision with her. He told her what to do before he legally fulfilled everything he was supposed to do. He was drawing her to himself. He was showing his character. And I have no doubt in here today that God has wanted to show you his character. Maybe you don't have a relationship with him. Um, maybe you've not taken that first step of faith to walk with him. Um, but I know for a fact that he is drawing you. And when you feel your heart beating like, oh my goodness, what is this woman talking about? I would never go forward in a church. I would never talk to someone about. Okay, that's just the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart, drawing you to him. And he just wants you to see his character. The same that Boaz was doing for Ruth. Um, and the way that we know that plan is through his word. His word shares that plan. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to know him. So I'm going to ask all of you to stand. There's going to be a little bit of music play. If you'll just stand with me now. Everybody up. There we go. Stretch your legs. We've been sitting for a little bit. And just bow our heads and close our eyes as the music plays. I know that God has been working in this room, in this weekend, through his word, through the different ladies that have spoken, because uh, he's been working in my heart. Uh, he's been replenishing me. He's been exposing me. Uh, and so... I know he's a faithful God, and if he's been doing that for me, I know he's doing that for others in this room. Not to us, for us, ladies, for our good. But maybe there's one person in here who doesn't know him as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've not started that relationship with God through his son, and you just have questions about that. If you would just take a moment and... With every head bowed and eyes closed, if you would just lift your hand so that I can know, so I can pray with you, so that maybe in private we could talk later. I just want you to have the abundance of God. I want you to know those things, and you can't know that abundance without a personal relationship with him. Is there one? I know it's scary. Like, I know it takes a lot of courage to lift that hand. And for those of us that do have a relationship with him, like I said, I know that he's been working in this room because I know that I have felt the Spirit of God working in my heart. And so I'm just going to pray. If you want to come to the altar and pray, if you want to pray where you're at, that's cool. If you want to get with somebody and pray. Who's that lady that's been taking you by the hand and discipling you formally or informally? just mentoring you, walking with you hand in hand and showing you the ways of the Lord. Maybe you want to get with her and pray with her and thank her. Um, but I'm just going to take this moment to pray and if you have something to deal with, come forward um, and uh, then we'll go on. Lord, thank you for this time that we could be in your word. God, thank you for the clarity of it, for the detail in it for how it specifically speaks to exactly what I need in certain situations, but how individually it speaks through, through your spirit to these ladies. Uh, Lord, not that it's a private interpretation, but it's, it's application in my life, Lord. 
that you have a purpose for me to fulfill in your kingdom. And if I need to know what that is, I got to be in your word. Thank you for these five things that you showed on how to walk with you. To glean right here, not to look elsewhere. To follow the ladies, to abide with you to know that you protect us and know that you provide for us. Lord, your word is, it's, it's shocking, Lord. Um, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity to be replenished. I thank you for the opportunity to go out of this place stronger, more like Jesus, ready to lock arms with our sisters and fight that spiritual battle that each of us does, Lord. Um, to do it alone would be futile. And I'm so thankful that you give us our sisters and our brothers in Christ to fight that battle with, Lord. Thank you for this time and for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa in a minute.